Welcome back to the OSHIP Show, where business acumen and transformative ideas set sail. Today, we're thrilled to bring you an episode that stands at the crossroads of building enduring brands and robust businesses with our distinguished guest and my friend, Fabian Gerholter. Fabian is the mastermind behind brand transformations that propel companies into the limelight and onto prestigious things like the Inc. 5000 list. With a career that spans guiding titans like Marriott and Warner Brothers to helping up and coming startups, his insights and strategies have not only been sold after by these kinds of industry leaders, but they've also been shared through his international best selling books and thought leadership and top publications. So, in today's episode, which I'm calling Building Brands vs. Building Businesses, we delve into the intricate dance of brand building. But here's the twist. Fabian isn't just about transforming existing entities. He's also on the frontier starting his own new ventures. And his latest endeavor, Tone Optic, aims to revolutionize the way we store and display vinyl records, combining form, function, and a keen sense of what makes a brand resonate. And as a former DJ in the 90s, I got to be honest, they're pretty cool. But the reality is this venture is a live case study in what it takes to build a business and a brand from the ground up in today's dynamic market. So I want you to join us as Fabian shares the lessons he's learned, the pitfalls he's navigated, and the exhilaration of turning a vision into a reality. So whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur or just starting out, this episode is a treasure trove of insights from someone who's living through the successes and setbacks of brand building. So tune in, lean in, and get ready to get inspired. This isn't just a conversation. It's a journey into the heart of what makes businesses flourish and brands thrive. And with that, let's get started with this week's O-Ship. Baby, and welcome to a ship. Oh, it's so good to be here. Thank you for that intro. And thanks for sharing your birthday with us. That's nice. I, I, Happy birthday. Yeah, this is a big day for me. So first of all, this is my first episode of 2024. And you took a little break. And I have to be honest, I really missed our ship. And I hope our audience did too. It is my birthday today. And so this is, as far as I'm concerned, the highlight of my birthday. So if there's anyone I want to start the year out with, it would be you because you're always fun to talk to. And I think that we're going to have kind of really interesting subject today. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. I don't think I know many people that are as passionate about brand building as you are. I'm obviously extremely passionate about building businesses. And I think they're not really the same thing in a lot of people's eyes. I actually know some people would argue that it is the same thing. And that's what I think this makes for a really interesting and healthy conversation today. Fabian, I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years. First off, if you know, for your own agency, Finian, which you've done some incredible work with over the years, and now as a partner at Chameleon Collective. But I think it would be really interesting if you shared a, kind of a brief bit of your background with our audience, just so they have some context of, of who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Me and my accent are both from Austria, from Vienna. And I studied communication design in Switzerland and then in the US and then got into working with brands like Pfizer, Lily Icos, the big corporate pharmaceuticals and like brand work. Then digital came and I started working on Acura, like the car brand and doing more digital work, but always from a brand lens. And then the minute the green card came in, I'm like, Oh, ship, that's it. <laughs> I got to start my business. And so that's a long time ago. And then I ran completely without having any entrepreneurial background and having absolutely no business doing business. I started out of my garage in Venice Beach. I started Gaia Halter Design, which was a horrible name because who can pronounce that? But it was very unique. Started Gaia Halter Design. It's, it's my... not as easy to spell as chameleon. So you're doing... You're doing Wicked. Right. A little easier chameleon. But yeah, my first intern turned into my first creative director. I went on and I ran the agency for a good uh, 20 12 years, head up to 18 people. I don't mean to embarrass you with some of your background, but I, I have of course to, you do. a lot of other people know there's another famous Austrian who lives in LA and is a transplant. At what point did you and Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of devolve in the bodybuilding scene and you went focused on that and he focused on acting? I mean, first, physically, I started taking on his physique, obviously. <laughs> that was the first thing I did. <laughs> <laughs> and then he slowly started learning about brand. Yeah, then, then you're like, you know what? You just didn't want to take it all away from him. And you said, I'm going to give this guy a shot. I'm going to focus on brand stuff. And we'll let this guy keep dabbling and acting. That's right. That's right. He's been doing pretty well. 
exactly. Yeah, actually, uh, funny enough, my office on Main Street in Santa Monica was literally like two blocks away from his restaurant. It was fun. Like we used to go there for Austrian food. And <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, I mean, that, that was Guy Halter Design. That was like one of those passion agencies, right? You've got the creative who's completely micromanaging like 10, 15 people. And you work late hours and everything is just for the art of it. And then at some point I realized that strategy is important. And me growing financially and everything as well as everyone else that needs to grow. And so there were pivots in there for sure. And some oh ship moments. Well. I, I, there's so many of those I want to get into. I've been trying to figure out the right place to kind of start our conversation today. And I do think we should lean in first, I think, on the essence maybe of, of brand building, because I think that's what most people know you for. I actually think of you as an entrepreneur first, but I'd love to kind of understand when you look back at your career, you've been doing this for a really long time. Can you share a kind of a moment of epiphany from your career that maybe has kind of shaped your approach to brand building? Yeah, it, it's actually interesting because what comes to mind is not necessarily a client engagement, but it was very much to where we were already drifting with having Guy Halter Design, having his agency, and it's super successful. I hired this uh, this little man called Your Bunch of Books. He's kind of like a like a guide to creatives to actually their business together. I hired him an enormous amount of money back then. I think back then it was like you know like ten thousand dollars, and he came into my office for a day. And he literally created clarity in a day. And to me, that was just so stunning. The idea that I trust someone so much that I pay him a big amount of money to do work. It's only psychological, it's, it's intellectual, it's strategic, but there's really no result as we're used to do in the creative industry where, you know, here's the deck, here's the logo, here are the graphics, right? So Having him over, paying that much money and having at the end of a day that he brought to us as a business, I was like, that's what my clients need. <laughs> so really at that point, um, it created so much clarity for me of like, why do that with our clients where we literally set the brand strategy for the business in a day? And while we do it, we actually get paid really well. You know, it's like value-based pricing. So to me, that was the biggest epiphany moment where I literally stole his, <laughs> stole the way that he worked. And I'm like, like I'm gonna... my epiphany, I mean, completely changing my business model tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Applied. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. You know, with graphic design and branding, individual, and it's kind of like it's surface level stuff that is important. It's absolutely important. But as you get older and as you, as you work with a lot of clients, you realize that without the right strategy, it's kind of meaningless, right? And so what he brought to the table is this like quick infusion of strategy in a day, even though it was for my creative business and around and all of that. That stuck with me. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, by now I've done, you know, with Chameleon Collective, I've done about 205 workshops with clients where in a day I'm basically flipping their brand around, you know, where they are the drivers. Like it's them who own it. Right. And we walk out of the day and we're basically ready to do any kind of creative and marketing work. And that to me was a huge epiphany. First off, I didn't realize the origin story of this kind of workshop uh, strategy approach. Uh, so I love that we had to get on a podcast for me to figure that out. <laughs> so, uh, super interesting. But the other thing that I can't take away from that is this sense that like as an entrepreneur and a lot of other business that you know, I talk to, sometimes there's a speed of business that you need to operate at. And I think when you talk about brand strategy and brand building with some of these huge global brands that you know, I've been fortunate enough and you've been fortunate enough to work with over the years. Look, it's not uncommon for a brand strategy engagement, six months, a year, longer than a year. Spreadsheets Easy. over spreadsheets. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, and, yeah. So, and then sometimes there's also the like, look, I need to move my business forward and I'll be dead in a year if I don't figure out some of these things. And so this kind of sense of urgency. You, you know what was so interesting about this? I really approach for startups. Right? Like I created this approach for business that needed it done fast because they need to launch in two, three weeks, right? They need a brand. And as it often is the case, I've been doing this for 20, 30 times and suddenly the Fortune 500s come knocking and they're like, wait, you do what? <laughs> you can actually do what agencies do for hundreds of thousands of dollars in six months. You say you can do this in a day. Tell me more. This is interesting. And that to me was really interesting too. Well, 
So I want to kind of segue off that. And I think, you know, there's this kind of balance I think everyone is always trying to do when you look at all the different levers you've got to grow your business, you know, whether it's brand, marketing, sales, e-commerce, whatever it may be. And you're trying to find to balance all these things and build a company at the, at the same time. And so I'd love to kind of have you maybe reflect on the journey that you've had with both Finian and Camilla Collective. And even before that, it sounds like, what would you say is the fundamental difference between building a brand and ultimately building a business? Because I know some people think of it the same way, but I'm not sure I, I believe that. Obvious is you can't build a brand without building a business right? So you need to have a business in order to build a brand. There's this amazing quote right behind me that I wrote myself, which I think is upside down. I don't know if it is for you, but it says, if you didn't have soul infused into your venture, you will always be a product or a service, but never a brand, right? And so that idea that on the surface level, and I think this is important, is you can have a successful product and a successful service and not be a brand, which means though that people buy your product because it's really good. They might forget the name, but they'll find it again eventually, right? But they're not going to follow you on socials. They're not going to love what you stand for. You're not on top of their mind at all times, right? That's the difference. But then like now with Tone Optic, and as you mentioned, like going through Finian, it's like there's so much more to building a business. B building a business is, <laughs> it's a lot, right? Like you said, oh, ship flies from all directions. <laughs> Building a brand is, oh, great, you already have the business. Let's come in and let's polish it and let's focus on the things you really do well so we can put a highlight, a spotlight on it, right? So is it easy? In a way, it is if you already have the foundations of having built a business that actually works well and has a product or service that people like. <laughs> I think especially when you talk to a lot of kind of agency folks or brand or creative people that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years, this idea like, hey, I'm building the name, I'm building this identity, I'm building this purpose and people are going to love it. And that's ultimately part of brand building that does not uh, make a, a company. And I think there's some really hard realities and a lot of the hardest parts of building a business are the bits that are unseen, not sexy no one talks about, and you're building a very a sexy product right now. And I know that you've dealt with some of the realities of what that means to build up. I'd love to jump to that for a minute and then come back and talk a little bit more around brand building for a moment. So just a, a little bit of a disclosure for anyone that's new to the show and or doesn't know this part of my history. In another life with much better hair, I was a DJ from about 1996 to 2003. While running other businesses, I was managing to figure out how to play two or three times a week. And I loved vinyl records. And so I had you know, thousands and thousands of vinyl records. As a DJ, you get all kinds of creative ways of building like bookshelves and racks to store all these things behind you. But this system that Fabian has put together called Tone Optic is dead sexy. All right. Well, it's definitely a sexy product. I appreciate that. <laughs> it helped tremendously when building the brand because look, here I'm doing something that no one else has done before. And I think the reason why I was able to do this is because I came out of the industry. It's not my industry. I came from outside in, right? So I'm like, record storage hasn't changed in 75 plus years, right? Either you have it on the wall, as you see right now, which we love because it looks amazing having that wall of records, right? Or you have it in a flip bin, which every significant other will hate because your home looks like a record shop, right? And it doesn't showcase how many records you have. So I'm like, wait a minute, can't I combine the two? <laughs> right? And it sounds like the simplest idea, right? It's like, you just pull it out, it rotates out, you flip through it, and you push it back in. Freddie. Really and beautiful, those... man. Something to be oh. proud of. <laughs> Thank you. But this was a journey of three years and in the six digits of just getting it into production. And that, to me, is absolutely, completely mind-boggling, right? Have you, because have just... you ever made a physical product before you no. went down this way? Oh, no, it would have cost me less. Yes, no, I, I have never done it. And when we're talking about failures, right, every single day, everything, just, right? Just approximately, how drunk were you when you decided that building a physical product? Thank you for seeing me like that. First, let's hit no alcohol infused in it. This was a pandemic moment. This was like a lonely moment where you suddenly like, 
I have all these records. I always listen to the same 10 because I can read the spine and they look great from on the shelf. And what about the other 1,900, right? And I'm like, I had a sketch for years. And I'm like, how about that sketch? And my biggest problem or maybe my biggest success moment was when I said, well, maybe I should just contact like someone who could maybe help me figure this out. And that was the problem. That was the one moment because after that, you hire someone, you create contracts, et cetera, et cetera, right? So. I can't help uh, but admire you for going down this path beyond it being a you know, beautiful product. But I also learned the hard realities of making a physical product. I've gone at it twice now. Once for one that I, we failed, actually. We just couldn't, we, after eight, nine months of going back and forth, we couldn't get it to where we wanted to and we just gave up. And it was a product, another product to store with another buddy of ours. And then I have another company that I'm involved with that makes effectively like environmental supplies, basically like commercial sewer caps for RV parks that people have no idea I'm involved in this business of all the random stuff I'm involved <laughs> Now in. they do. Now, now you do. But I was something a business that I wasn't expecting to get into. And, and that's another episode in its own right. But yeah, having to learn about manufacturing after years of doing digital work and it's hard. You've got supply chain issues. You've got a new way of design thinking. You have very big, tangible capital outlays. You can't just work through the night to get things done. You've got to put cold, hard cash down to make these things work. And that's scary. It is scary. And it's the unforeseen too, right? Like, so supply chain issues, they might happen, right? But you don't know when they will happen. But product problems will happen. You don't know when they will happen. You know, it's like always this surprise. And that's also on the positive side, right? Like last night, I'm like, why do we have four times as much traffic on our site? What's going on? Then I realized someone tweeted the product and it gets shared and shared. And by the end of the day, it had 900,000 views. And here I am going about my day and I'm like, okay, I'm going to spend the night literally replying to everyone because there was no link and no mention of what that product is to every single one and being friendly and not being... So, but it's like that kind of stuff that every day, you don't know how the day ends. And that's on the one hand for people like you and I and a lot of leaders that are listening, that's super exciting and it's the thrill of everything because you just don't know where it goes. But this can go the other way where we ship our first product and it arrives completely damaged and little did we know that we forgot that one piece of packaging and suddenly you're like, right? So it goes both ways. But if you're not into surprise, whew. <laughs> <laughs> What's the number one lesson you've learned from working on Tone Optics so far as uh, your first physical product company? No matter how boring or are you in the weeds it is, like what was it that you're like, Wow, that was unexpected. And I'll take that to as a new lesson, so to speak. So many new lessons. Freddie, that, that literally two weeks into Tone Optic, I started writing a book about my journey through Tone Optic because I'm like, if everything fails, at least I get a book out of it. <laughs> it's like, that's the entrepreneur behind the entrepreneur. I'm like, All right. So in half of the book or more than that, it's like failures, right? And like big lessons, right? I think what most probably would be the most interesting to our listeners, like as marketers and in that vein, is really what I learned professionally as a brand builder, now building my own, as you mentioned, business first and then brand, right? Like doing that. It's the small stuff that really hurts. It's not creating the name and the logo and like, which I do professionally, well, right? And I think well, it's hard to course correct a physical product to get a tiny detail. It's not like a oh. website where you can go fix it and be like, okay, it's fixed everybody. It's iterations and iterations and how long everything takes, right? And even if you work with the fastest people in the industry, right? Like it just takes a long and mighty long time. And from the brand building perspective, what I learned is that, and I'm implementing this now, like with Chameleon of like, how can I change my own services? And I'm very productized with my services. I'm like, here are the three services. Like I'm actually learning that all of these sub services that people really need. I'm working with an entrepreneur that's building a new camera. It's very similar, right? Hardware product, super competitive, right? Like Apple has hundreds of thousands of people in their like camera space specific. But the things that he needs are very similar to the things that I need myself with Tone Optic when it comes to brand building. And they're small things of like, can you create a launch plan for me? Like what is the cadence, right? So now I'm doing cadence plans for startups, right? Because I'm like, that's what people need. So I really learned that it's like, Social media, the first 10 posts, so important. Who's going to write them? Who's going to design them? But it's not about hiring the copywriter and the designer and the brand builder. It's like just one person who gets it done, right? Very much putting the startup hat on. 
I guess. It's really getting these small things out quickly and not just focusing on the big things. I get a lot of joy out of it because now I know how much people struggle <laughs> because I did myself too, right? Getting every post out for Tone Optic, it's work, right? And people are like, oh, you got to post three times a day. I'm like, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible as an entrepreneur, one person, right? I want to go back specifically to that startup issue. But before, I do want to point out one thing that I think is quite interesting for those of you in the audience who may be used to working in a digital space, like I've spent a good part of my career, it's funny when you do something in marketing or digital or you know, something like that, whether if it's a brand or communications or messaging, or even you have a digital product, you can course correct mistakes quite quickly. But if you produce hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands, whatever it may be, or millions of units of a physical product and ship it, there's nothing short of a recall to course correct it, which is extremely damaging for a brand. So they say a lot of times in the startup world, this concept like fail first, but I think that's really like a tech mentality in my opinion, because you can iterate so rapidly. And so it's kind of so thinking true. through that lens yeah. with this kind of rise of startups and this rapid innovation that's out there, which may not always be a, a digital innovation, like I said a second ago. And this kind of new epiphany you've had, I think, with really getting back in the weeds of early stage startups again, how should these new companies approach branding differently maybe than, let's say, established ones at this point? It's a fantastic question. There was a funny moment a couple of months ago when, when my designer, who helps me with some things because I can't do everything myself, right? So I have a designer who helps me with it. And Tone Optic is all black and it's gold and it has like this old feeling to gain trust. And my audience is, they're all in the 40s, 50s, 60s. So I wanted to have that. And then suddenly like she does a post. I'm like, do this post. And she does the post and it's white. Like it's totally different color scheme. And I'm like, hey, so what happened? And she literally just said, the brand evolved. It makes more sense. And I didn't question it for a second. I'm like, oh, you're right. Right. And so this idea of like, here's the 400 page brand Bible, and we're going to change the brand again in six years from now. It's over. A brand moves. It's organic. It's like, what is the feedback? What does the industry do? Oh, here's a new competitor. We got to shift over to this a little bit into this. Oh, we've got the trademark issue here. Oh, the product is now functioning. Whatever happens in the day to day, your brand needs to showcase that and it needs Focus to adapt. Fluidity, ment mental flexibility. Yeah, yeah, but with a brand, that's usually not the case. It's like, here's our style. Yeah. Here's what we do. Step and repeat, right? This is why, though, I feel like your Resonate approach to brand strategy is so effective for startups because, again, a lot of empathy with you. I am founded another company recently, Collective OS, that is its own business, and so I'm more on the board and supporting them. But it's forced me to very much put my early stage, like true, really early start startup hat on. And you're balancing this constant balance between like the needs of moving really quickly and building brands, building a product. And I think the one thing that is unarguable or whatever you want to call it in the startup space is it's a perpetual change, perpetual. And if you're not comfortable exactly. with that, you're screwed. Exactly, absolutely. Meltdown, yeah. and especially in product, I think that's the one thing. And I think my wife told me that. Usually, the ones behind us are the smart ones, right? And she said, if it wouldn't be that hard, like more people would do it, and that's how you have a bigger chance to actually like make it, right? So many people give up in the product startup game because it is so hard, right? It's in hardware. It's hard, right? But yeah, back to the branding point. I do want to make sure that people understand listening. It's like when we changed from black to white, that was something where we still had like some similar colors in the type, the same typography, right? It's not like you can't pivot with branding in that way, right? You still need to make a slow change where you say like, well, there are similarities and people still know it's us, right? But you have to continuously improve with a business, period. And branding is part of your business. Things that I think you might be able to bring an interesting point of view on that others may not have is... You've been doing these Resonate workshops, and I don't think we've said it expressly, but Resonate is this kind of the, the methodology and approach that you've created to doing these rapid strategy workshops. And simultaneously, you've also got your own podcast called Hitting the Mark, which I have to be a big fan of on a side note. And you're constantly talking to other entrepreneurs and founders. And through all, just like how I think I, you know, I get a certain perspective from all the wonderful people I'm able to talk to through OShare. 
Have you noticed any recurring themes or struggle that you're starting to see consistently between all these founders or maybe the leaders even within these Resonate workshops? With hitting the mark with the podcast, I find it fascinating because I'm basically cheating. I'm learning about what I do professionally from leaders, from entrepreneurs who actually have done it, right? And so what I see over and over as a theme is that the most successful entrepreneurs are the ones that actually come from the outside into an industry, right? So you have the guy from Liquid Death, right? <laughs> Who comes into the water space, which is occupied by really boring brands. And he comes from the advertising world and he's like, we want to have fun, right? Or the gentleman who started Norwegian wool, which is coats. He doesn't come from the fashion industry. He was a commodities trader on Wall Street, right? And he's like, I want something that is thick, but it's stylish and da da da. And he's like, I'm just going to do that. It's completely bonkers when you think about it. It's like you have no business doing that. But because he comes from the outside world and he's like, oh, well, this is how we would do it over in commodities trading. Here's how I'm going to approach the business. Or this is how we do it in advertising. This is why I want to build a water brand this way. I start seeing that theme occurring over and over again, where people solve a problem that is their personal problem or where they see a space and they have no business being there. And that's why they're successful. Look, yes, it's the same with Tone Optic, right? I have no business building a hardware you know, startup in the hi-fi audio space, right? But yet I come in and I most probably do it very differently than like someone within the space would do. Yeah. I'm not launching at a trade show. I'm going D to C. Like for retailers, I give them a coupon online. There's no like, I'm going to ship you 10 units. You're going to have it in storage. Then you're going to put it on sale. I'm like, this does not work. Like, this does not work for me. And people love it. They're like, we've never heard of this approach. And I'm like, me neither, but it makes sense. And they're like, it does. <laughs> so. I love that. I, by the way, as, as a CEO, I was like, I know someone I should be gifting one of these tone optics to that would really enjoy it. I'm not going to say their name because I think they might want your ship. I know so. someone who knows someone who might be able to get that done. <laughs> might be, might be Let's to connect. Let's okay, sounds, sounds good. <laughs> so, you know, Thayman, this, this was a wonderful episode. There are so many other things I wanted to get into, like your book writing and, and the fact that you've knocked out so many books over the years and done very well with it. But I also want to be conscious of, of time. And I have to ask, this is the first episode of 2024, and if it wouldn't be a ship if we didn't ask for an O-ship question. So I really want to dig into something in your background that you think would maybe be inspiring or funny or interesting or useful to anyone that might watch the show. And and for those of you who may be turning into OSHIP for the first time or tuning into OSHIP for the first time today, one of the core premises of the show is that when you look at really successful people and the long list of guests that we've had on the show over the years, I think it's very easy to look at these people and go, Wow, genius. They go from point A to point B. It was perfect. Why am I such a failure? It's really easy to get down on yourself in today's world, especially with social media and, and a lot of the media making everyone look so perfect all the time. And so I love this idea that we're able to talk to different leaders and say, some point along the way, I know that you either fell flat on your face or almost completely fell flat on your face. And in some way, you must have course corrected to get things back on track. And I'd love to hear one of these O-Ship stories that kind of maybe talks about that moment and maybe something you learned. And by the way, some of those people are like, I don't know if I learned anything, but this was not funny when it happened, but it's really funny now. It could be funny. It could be sad. It can make us cry. Whatever it is, I want a great O-Ship story. So you got no pressure, but you're well, the I, I mean, story of 2024. Look, this podcast has a time limit. <laughs> You're like, right. and so we're done. I, I could tell you the entire tone optic story, which would make you weep, but there's going to be a book about that. No. So look, I mean, there's so many failures. There's a really, really big failure and oh ship moments, right? It's always difficult because usually these are the moments where in the moment you think it's the worst thing that ever happened to you. And it's, yeah, it, it's literally, it's like you're on the ground and everyone tells you most probably you're going to come back, you know, bigger, better and smarter. And you don't want to hear a thing about it, but it's always the case. Always. Right. So whenever, whenever that moment hits, like you always come out. So for me, Santa Monica running an agency, um, you know, had like 14 people, a friend of mine, we did a handshake deal. 
there we go. <laughs> we did a handshake deal. He started buying all of these real estate, you know, like a, a hotel here and this there. And he's like, Fabian, you and your agency, you're going to do everything from the branding to the menus, to the websites, to the e-commerce engine, to like literally, I mean, tons and tons of work, right? And so I started hiring. He needed more work. I started hiring. I kept hiring. We kept doing more work. Amazing, right? Just popping out. us, growing. Everything is great. Um, till, until one day, you know, one of my employees um, quit and she started working for him the next day, told all kinds of lies and weird stuff. And suddenly, like, no more work is coming our way. Suddenly, all the bills that are outstanding are not being paid. Suddenly, I'm like, oh, did I just put all my eggs into one basket and there was no great contract? Yes, yes, I did. Did I just hire a lot of people without having the foresight of, yes, yes, I did. So that was me. In my, this was me in my late 20s, early 30s. Um, very different now. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. That was like the prelude to our first question today of me hiring David Baker to get things figured out, right? So it really, to me, when I think about that moment, it changed my entire career to the positive. It was the best thing that could have happened to me, but it was the hardest, hardest, hardest moment, right? But there are so many lessons and all these lessons are very obvious, you know, in hindsight. But every time I have too big of a client, you know, I'm like getting very nervous and I try to balance and, you know, contract super important, payment super important, not growing quickly. And you know how we do this at Chameleon, right? It's all very smart. <laughs> I really appreciate you sharing uh, that story, Fabian. And before we sign off for the day, I do want to share a quick kind of personal message with everyone. And I think that is in the spirit of, you know, oh, ship, 2023 was a hard year for a lot of us. I think even if you were doing well, most of us weren't doing as well as that we had in prior years. And it caused a lot of us, uh, whether you're a middle manager or an entrepreneur or a business leader or in the C-suite, or you're just an up and coming person in your career and the way that maybe you even reflected on your own personal security, you know, your professional security within your job. You know, I think there was this nervousness and tension in 2023. And I would like to believe that OSHIP was a safe haven for some of you that maybe needed a place to kind of hear that life, it doesn't always work out perfectly, but that in the end, you will persevere. And so what I'd like to say to each and every one of you is Happy New Year. Thank you for all the support that you gave us in 2023. We topped out the year with over 7,500 YouTube uh, subscribers over 15,000, maybe even over 16,000 uh, podcast subscribers. And, and I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for you. And I'm thankful for the other people and the guests that have come on and shared their stories, not just because I got to share them with all of you, which is fun for the o Ship Show, but it inspired me and helped me keep my sanity. And so I think that 2024 is going to be an exciting year. It's going to be an exciting year for me personally. My new house will be done that I'm moving into. I've been working into for years. I've got new businesses launching. And I'm very excited about where my main baby, uh, Camillion Collective, with all my partners there, is going to go. So I'm hopeful and excited for where this year goes. And I hope all of you are too. And with that, I'd like to thank Fabian again for joining us. Fabian, where is the, the best way for people to follow you or, or learn more about you if they want to uh, get engaged? Oh, yeah. I mean, LinkedIn is most probably the best place. And, and uh, you know, hitting the mark, the podcast, don't want to take away from your podcast, but after oh, oh ship, you know, you can always <laughs> go over there if you need more, right? <laughs> yeah, but LinkedIn is usually, usually the... I mean, it sounds yeah. really optimistic. So, you know, it's like the more the nihilist type people might be over here in our ship show, you know, hitting the marks, the opt, you know, uber optimists. And if you just need to like mix it up just to get your endorphin levels right, you do a bit of him. It's all about me. balance in 2024. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for watching this week's episode. If you want to learn more about us, go to oshipshare.com. Uh, best thing you can do to support this podcast is share, like, tell your friends, give it a comment, put it on your LinkedIn feed. All those things help us continue to bring great content every week. But if nothing else, I'm just glad you're here. Thanks again. Thanks again, Fabian. And we'll see all of you next week on O-Ship.